How are we? Good. Well, it's good to be back with you. Last week, I was just above Centennial speaking at a high school event uh, for a winter retreat. So there was about 40 or so junior high and high school kids, and uh, we spent Saturday skiing, and then we had sessions throughout the weekend. I got to share about David a little bit, um, and then about at this point, we were wrapping up last week. And so it was good. I, you know, going down the ski hill, I only fell like once and only hurt my knee once. So it was good. I call that a success. <coughs> it's fine. Um, we're talking about Reboot. Uh, we're in this series called Reboot. We're looking at Paul's life uh, and really looking at it under a microscope in a lot of ways. Uh, the passages that we keep going back to on Paul's life, they keep kind of recurring, but we keep kind of looking at them from different angles. And so uh, we're going to be doing this through the end of the month or so. But the idea with Reboot is that we want to reboot our lives towards God. And we want to reboot our focus in a few different areas towards what God wants us to do. And throughout this, you know, we've been looking at the life of Paul in the New Testament, who used to be Saul. Many of us know his story, right? Like, like Saul was a man who was avidly against Christians, and he sought to persecute them. He, we first meet Saul when he is standing by approving of the stoning of Stephen, who was the first martyr in the New Testament, because he was following Jesus. Saul made it his personal mission to seek out believers and put them in prison and, and, and try to get them killed because they followed Jesus. And so this was what Saul was about. Uh, but we have this kind of, we have this but God moment in Saul's life, right? But God intervened in his life, but God got into Saul's life and, and changed Saul's plans. And we see in Acts chapter 9 that Saul was on his way to Damascus for doing the same thing that he had been doing all of his life. He's seeking out Christians. He's on his way to Damascus, and, and God confronts him and, and calls him out for what he's been doing. And Saul's life totally changed at this point. His, his life totally took a new direction because of this interaction that he had with God on the road to Damascus there. And this singular moment in Saul's life changed his entire life significantly. We've talked about it <coughs> excuse me, over the last several weeks. We, we talked about how this singular moment changed his life towards a rev revolution in people's lives around him. And we talked about how, how this singular moment gave him a refocus towards Christ. And we talked about how this singular moment repurposed his life towards God's purposes. And we talked uh, about how uh, this singular moment gave him a rejuvenation in his relationship with Christ. And then last week, Dennis unpacked how the singular moment allowed Paul to kind of step back and retreat in Christ. And so today we want to look at, again, because of this singular moment in, in Paul's life, we want to look how he was able to reconnect in places that he needed to connect. And, and we generally like the idea of reconnecting, right? Like, like this is something we, we're kind of okay with. Like, like we like connecting with people maybe from our past or that we went to school with. Like a few years ago, I had my 10-year reunion and got to reconnect with some of those people. And then we haven't talked since, kind of like how we ended high school. Anybody else? Let's be real here. How many of us actually talk to all of our high school friends? Yeah, that's kind of the way it went for me too. Yeah, but we like the idea of reconnecting, right? Like it makes us feel good when a friend reaches out to us and says, hey, let's grab coffee. We haven't talked for a while, right? Like, like we generally like it when, when we get to reconnect with family that we haven't seen for a while. This idea of reconnecting is a good thing, and it's one of those things that we need in our lives. I think it fuels our lives when we relationally reconnect with people, but I, it also refuels our relationship with Jesus. As a church, we want to connect people to Jesus Christ and each other. Like, this is what we are about. This is, this is what drives us. And as individuals, we should be about wanting to connect with Jesus. We should be about wanting to connect with other people around us. And we should be about wanting to connect with the community around us, with the world around us. And you might be sitting here saying, and I, and I get it, right? Like, like, I don't need to reconnect. I'm good, right? Like, I, I'm, I've got all the connection in my life that I need. And maybe that's you, and maybe that's, you know, that's great. If, if that's really you, and that's really what's going on, but maybe let me push against that a little bit. Let me ask some questions that can maybe challenge that a little bit, like, like this. How many times in the last week have you actually spent with the Lord? And is there a reconnection that needs to take place there? Or how about this? How many, how many Sundays 
in a month do you come and attend church? And maybe is there an element where you need to reconnect there? How about this? How, are, are you actually connected to a Bible study or a care group? Are you connected to, to Christian community outside of just what you get on Sunday morning? Or do you need to reconnect there? Or are, you, are you serving somewhere? Are you plugged into ministry somewhere where you're the hands and feet in light of, of Christ to people around you? Or, or do you need to reconnect there? Or are, you, are you engaged in, in the community in such a way where you're, you have the opportunity to share Christ with people who maybe don't know who he is? Or is there an opportunity to reconnect there? I mean, let me just ask how many people did you invite to church within the last year? How many people have you been able to talk with them about their relationship with Jesus? Like, like maybe there are opportunities, even if we think that we're good, maybe there are still opportunities for us to reconnect with Jesus, to reconnect with the church, to reconnect with the community around us. Because here's the thing, I think no matter how connected we feel or how connected we believe that we are, there is always room to make those connections stronger in our lives. There are always opportunities for us to to work on the connections that we have. No matter how strongly we feel like we're connected, there is always room for improvement there, and every one of us can do this. Let's dive into Paul here. I I think one of the things that makes Paul such a great impact on, on people around him, on the world around him, was because he was connected in these three main areas that that we've been talking about. He was connected to the church, he was connected to Christ, and he was connected to the community around him. Like, these were things that were happening in his life, and I think this greatly had an influence on his influence and impact on the world around him. And as you may know, he wasn't always connected to these, right? In fact, uh, in a lot of ways, he was opposite of this. Like, he, he, he before hated the church. He wanted to persecute the church. But once he got connected to Christ, he became connected to the church as well. And really, he, be, he became connected to, to the world around him in a different way than before, in a much more positive way. So we want to just explore this this morning, the three ways that Paul was connected uh, to different areas and, and what that looks like for us. And so the first one is this, Paul was connected with Christ. Paul was connected with Christ. And Paul was on his way to Damascus, and Jesus appears to him, and this is what it says, Acts chapter 9, we've read it before, but let's start in verse 3 and read it again. It says, as he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. A couple things, just to make note of here couple things. First, Jesus takes it personally how his church is being treated. Jesus takes it personally how his church is being treated. I mean, he calls Saul out at this point. Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Why are you persecuting my bride, Jesus said. Secondly is this, Jesus wants a personal relationship with us. Not only does he care how his church is being treated, but he wants a personal relationship with with us. He reaches out to Paul in this moment and and begins this relationship. Jesus loved Paul so much that he arranged for Paul to be physically touched. This is what we say, what it says if we jump down to verse 17 and 18 in the same chapter. It says, so Ananias left and entered the house and he placed his hands on him, meaning Paul, and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me to you, sent me so that you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and then he got up and was baptized. Connecting with Jesus, church, changes our perspective. Connecting with the church around us, excuse me, connecting with Jesus around changes our perspective around us. It changes first how we see ourselves. It changes how we look at ourselves. If you think that you are less than, you have not really seen Jesus and experienced Jesus. If you are thinking about hurting yourself or doing something destructive, you have not really seen Jesus. Having an interaction with Jesus, having a connection with Jesus, it it not only changes how we see ourselves, it changes how we see others around us as well. It changes how we interact with people. If you don't love people and have compassion on the hurting, 
have compassion on the outcast, then you haven't really seen Jesus in your life. And not only that, not only does it change how you see yourself and you change, see how you, changes how you see other people, it, it changes how you see Jesus himself. It changes how you see Jesus. Paul hated Christians up until this point. He didn't have this belief in Jesus, but after Jesus appeared to him, it, it totally changed Paul's perspective. And we know what he goes on to do in his life. Like, seeing Jesus changed Paul's perspective. It showed him ultimately that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is King. And here's my prayer for us this morning. Like, I hope that the scales, like for what Paul did, I hope the scales can fall off our eyes and we can experience and we can see Jesus for who he really is. And we can have that real connection with him. And that can happen a few different ways. You know, we offer a few things here, and many of you are aware of these things, opportunities for us to connect with Jesus. You're sitting in one of them right now, like weekend services, what happens here at 9 o'clock, right? It's 9 o'clock? I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> time change. Uh, 9 o'clock and then 11 o'clock, like, like this is an opportunity for us to experience Jesus, to connect to Jesus, to worship Him. You know, we encourage people, be regular in weekend services. But not just that, get involved in community that points us towards Jesus, right? We have care groups, we have Bible studies to be a part of. And this is opportunities for us to, to chase after Jesus, to learn about Jesus, to, to grow in Him as we're doing this with other people around us. And, and then one that we just had yesterday morning, we've had it for the last several months, first Saturday of the month, pray first. Where it's simply an opportunity for us to come together, to worship together, and, and then to pray, and to have that connection with Christ. Paul was committed to connecting with Christ. He was committed to this, and as a result, some amazing things happened, and we see that in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. It says, it says this, so the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit and it increased in numbers. This is the result in part of what Paul was focusing on in connecting with, with Christ. So Paul first was focused on connecting with Christ. Secondly, Paul was connected with the church. Paul was connected with the church. After his conversion, uh, before his ministry really began, Paul went out and he spent three years connecting with God and he also spent time connecting with believers during that time as well. And there are some things that we just need to embrace in this. Like when we start talking about connecting with community, talking about connecting with other believers, sometimes we push back and say, oh no, I don't need that, right? I don't need to connect with other people. I don't need, to, I don't need that in my life. But here's the reality. We are not de designed to do life alone. We are not designed to do life alone. We are not designed to follow after Jesus by ourself. Life change happens through community. It happens in relationships, and it happens through a process. And other people are involved in that process. Paul's life was radically changed because of the relationships that he built with other believers. Not taking Jesus out of the picture. I'm not saying Jesus isn't important in that. But I'm saying that this community is a part of this. Paul's life was radically changed, yes, because he was connected to Jesus, and yes, because he was connected to community around him. He was connected to other believers around him. And we, we have opportunities for this here. Like we just talked about one of them already, care groups, small groups, Bible studies. This is a great way to walk in community after Jesus together. Like, I wouldn't trade my care group for anything in the world. We love each other. We support each other. We chase after Jesus together. And it's a fantastic opportunity. We encourage everybody to do that. But not just that. There, there's so many other opportunities for us to, to get in community with each other. You get in community, honestly, when you do something together. And, and there's, there are things to be done. There are, there are ministries that need service. There are tasks that need done. There are so many ser serving opportunities that can be done, and we grow not only in Jesus, but in a relationship with each other when we lock arms and say, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to engage in this ministry. We're going to take care of this thing. And then we have events. We have events that are taking place, like in your bulletin. Let this be announcements for today, maybe. You can check out some events that are going on there. Like we have a marriage event coming up in a few weeks, not just for young married people, like 
It's for everybody. And we're going to talk about, you know, who's on your team and your marriage. And it's a great way for us to sit around a table with multiple different generations, multiple different demographics speaking into each other's marriages. It's a great opportunity for us to grow and connect together. And here's what I want to do, and I mean this very literally, okay? Take your finger and poke yourself in the belly button. Come on. Come on. I'll wait. It's fine. Come on. That belly button, you all didn't do it, okay? That belly button is a constant reminder for us that we were once fully dependent on another person. That belly button is a constant reminder for us that we spent a significant part of our lives fully dependent on another individual, and since we were released from that, we live our lives trying to reconnect with other people. It doesn't go go away. Our our desire for connection to other people doesn't go away after we're born. Like we We live our lives trying to reconnect, trying to connect with other people because we need relationships. We crave relationships. We desire them in our lives. So Paul was committed to connecting with the church, and this is what happened because of that. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Sound familiar, right? So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, and it increased in numbers. So Paul was connected to Christ. He was connected to the church. And finally, Paul was connected with his community. He was connected with his community. He was connected with the world around him. That's what we mean here. Acts chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. It says, Immediately he began, began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. But all who heard him were astonished, astounded and said, Isn't this the man who in Jerusalem was destroying those who called on this name and then came here for the purpose of taking them prisoners to the chief priests? As Saul grew more capable and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this one is the Messiah. He kept growing and becoming more and more capable uh, of doing this. And here's the reality. Like, Paul continued to be connected to community around him. He was connected to the world around him. He didn't remove himself from the world that was going on around him in order just to live secluded with maybe a few people that were like-minded. No, his community around him was made up of people who liked him, who didn't like him. They, his community, community was made up of the Jews, of the Gentiles, of, of anybody that he could be around and build a relationship with. This was his community. This was who he put himself with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul gives his approach to connecting with community. This is what it says, starting in verse 19. It says, although I am a free man and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without that law, like one without the law, not being without God's law, but within Christ's law to win those under, or excuse me, to win those without the law. To the weak I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may, I may by every possible means save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel so I may become a partner in its benefits. What are we willing to do to win some? What are we willing to do to win some? What are you willing to do to, to save some? Are, are you willing to serve and get involved in ministry in order to save some? Are you willing to invite others to join us in order to save some? Or are you willing to get into relationships for the purpose of growth and discipleship, in order to help people grow up and know Christ more in order to save some? Are you willing to go out and get in relationships with people who don't know Jesus in order to hopefully save some? What are you willing to do? Paul was committed to connecting with his ministry, and he was, and he honestly was willing to do just about anything short of sin in order to hopefully reach some. 
And the results were amazing. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, and it increased in numbers. This is the dream. Like, this should be our dream, right? That, that we are so connected with Christ and the church and the community around us that 60,000 plus people around us that can come and be connected with Christ because of what we are doing in our lives. This should be the dream for us, church. And I believe the best way to do that is what we see in Paul. When we are connected with Christ, we are connected with other believers, with our church, and we are connected with the community around us. At what moment, church, are you willing to allow Christ to take you from where you are at to where he wants you to be in your connection with other people? At what point is that going to take place? At what point are you going to allow him to do that? Like, what's it going to take? Because we can't force you, right? Like, we can't force you to sit down and spend an hour with Jesus a day. Like, we, we're, we are in no way going to, you know, make you keep a log of how many hours that you spend doing church things, right? Like, we're, we, there's no way that we're going to mandate that you attend certain things or you go to certain environments. All we can do is put it out there and say, hey, we encourage you to do this. We encourage you to be a part of this. We encourage you to get involved. But what I'm talking about is you looking at your life and you looking at your relationships with Jesus and, and seriously asking the question, do I need to reconnect? Do I need to reconnect with God? Have I been missing that connection in my life recently? Have I gotten too busy to where I've kind of put that prayer time, that personal study time, that reading time off to the side because of other things? Do I need to reconnect with God? Have I been just floating through life on my own? Have I been just faking a relationship with Jesus? Maybe we need to reconnect with God. Maybe we need to ask the question, do I, need to, do I seriously need to reconnect with my church? Do I need to reconnect with people around us? I mean, how, how committed am I really? How, how dedicated am I really to the biblical community that I need to be a part of? How invested am I? How much am I willing to give? How much am I willing to serve? How much am I willing to get involved? Do I need to connect more with my church? Or maybe we need to ask the question, do I need to seriously reconnect with my community around me? Because I think at times we can get ourselves so secluded and so removed from everybody else around us that we have zero interaction with people who are not like-minded believers like us, right? And I think God calls us to go out and be light in a dark world full of people who don't know him. So maybe we have to ask the question, maybe, you know, maybe I, need to, maybe I need to get involved. Or maybe I need to redefine the relationships that I have with people in the community to where I am more intentional about talking with them about Jesus, about pointing them towards Jesus, about being that love and light towards Christ in their life. Maybe I need to ask God to, to just radically show me what I'm supposed to do, who I'm supposed to be involved with in my community. You know, I, my, I, I've told off and on, I think, about my kids. They swim like I don't know anything about swimming I, I sink pretty well um, but my kids twice a week go down to South High School and are a part of Capital City Athletics Swim Club uh, they grew up going to you know they've the two Brecken and Hannah have, have kind of completed swimming lessons and they are better swimmers than I am um, and you can laugh at that, that's fine. And now they're on the competitive swim side. And so I go down to South High School twice a week and I sit in the sauna that is South High School pool for about two hours a day and watch them swim back and forth in the water and they're getting better. And they're, comp they're uh, competing in, in events and all this stuff. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I got approached and said, hey, uh, we are a parent-led uh, organization, it's a nonprofit, and so uh, we would like to know if you would like to be on the board. I have a problem with saying no sometimes, and so you laugh at that like I, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
So I said, sure, that doesn't sound like very much work. Um, I spent about three months just as a board member at large before they were like, hey, we need a treasurer and you're up. Um, yeah, not great. So I <laughs> just kept getting deeper and deeper into this club. And, and a few months ago, I'm sitting here going, how in the world did this happen? And it was just one step after the other. But here's what I've realized. I, I don't necessarily like don't tell my kids, okay? This is a safe environment. I don't necessarily like swimming. It is kind of boring. Uh, and the pool is hot, and it's humid, and uh, those bleachers are not comfortable. Um, but here's the thing. My kids being involved in swimming has allowed me to rub shoulders with people that I would never rub shoulders with. It has allowed me to get in a position to where... <laughs> If people have problems with their accounts financially, they have to talk to me. <laughs> and sometimes that opens the door to other conversations when they realize, oh, hey, he works for a church. Oh, hey, he follows this Jesus. What does that look like? Even though I don't like necessarily swimming and I certainly don't like doing the, the books, it allows me the opportunity to rub shoulders with people who don't know Jesus, who, who don't know about his love and his grace, and I get to point them towards Jesus, and I get to point them towards them, and I get to, to love on them. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have the whole club at the other end of this building for a banquet, and they're going to get to at least see a little bit of what goes on here, and, and it's just little things like that that we get the opportunities to invest in other people outside of this building. I think this is what God calls us to. I, I think God calls us to, to get involved with people to put ourselves in, in, in places where we can build relationships with people like Larry, like Jason, like Aaron, like Margaret, and others, to where hopefully through just a lot of little conversations, a lot, a lot of prayer for them, we can point them towards Jesus in hopes that they will come to a saving relationship with him. I think this is what we are called to do, and I think we see this in Paul's life. And so I want you just to think about this. And we've asked this question, these questions already, but think about what is God calling you to that's ambitious? What's God calling you to that's ambitious? What is he calling you to do right now that you may think is just crazy, that's just out there, like, hey, you should do the books for a, <laughs> a swim club. Yeah, I'm just missing it on two counts. What's ambitious there that God is calling you to do? Secondly, what is something contagious that God is calling you to be involved in that spreads like wildfire when it takes off? What's God calling you to do that's contagious? What, what's God calling you to do that's, that's courageous, that takes guts, that takes sacrifice, that maybe takes a little bit of risk? What's God calling you to do that's courageous? What, fourth, what's God calling you to that's outrageous, that can change the world around us because we step out in faith following, following Him? Let us never be okay, church staying where we're at. Let us never be okay just going through the motion saying, yeah, I'm doing enough. Yeah, I'm involved enough. Yeah, I do. You know, my relationship with Jesus is, is enough. 